jump into questions about what IFC does. And then like a general discussion about like COVID, what we see, what we don't. I'm not an expert, mm-hmm. but I can tell you what we've seen, what works, what doesn't. Uh-huh. Great, great. Let's start in two, three minutes. No worries. Ron, can you
we are live now we are live great we're live great okay tarik hum everyone uh, this is asfar and i am the program manager at national incubation center karachi today we have a very special guest and uh, he has agreed to come on a very short notice and we are very grateful to him uh, we have isa ghabi who's investment officer at the ifc and he looks after the venture capital area isa is has a has over 15 years experience in finance and investments with a focus on venture capitalism a uh, venture capitalist and uh, He has executed 50 plus direct and indirect investment deals, and he has managed Mina Venture Fund. So, uh, welcome to the show, uh, Isa. And uh, we Thank we you, would sir. like to start off uh, with your background uh, and uh, your exposure with the Mina market, and now you since you're looking in the Pakistani side of investment as well. So, what's your take yeah. on it? Yeah. No. Sure. So just quick background about myself. Uh, well, thanks for having me first and foremost. It was great to talk to good people. Um, so my background is I've been in the VC space, quote unquote, for the past 15 years. And that spanned across many different uh, venues, uh, let's say. So I started off with probably one of the first venture capital funds in the Middle East back in the mid 2000, maybe seven, around that time period of time. where literally no one knew what the word entrepreneurship is you know opening a business was an opening up a business right the word entrepreneurship brand became that and i was lucky enough to join that fund by mistake you know i was a junior guy you know stumbled upon it and and i've been doing it ever since a number of different capacities uh, a couple of uh, venture funds one corporate venture vehicle I did uh, some consulting for a bit of period of time and more uh, recently I run the VC practice for the region uh, for IFC and I'll get to that in a second but generally speaking most of my career has focused on uh, early stage investing executed around five transactions uh, sorry 50 transactions across the value chain everything from seed to growth capital as well as fund of fund investing uh, I have around and how you classify them let's say six exits over the past five years out of the region which is great because you can prove and validate that this model works uh, and more recently i joined ifc to oversee the vc practice and i'll come to what that is in terms of what my exposure is to pakistan honestly before i joined ifc i never looked at pakistan as a market to invest in uh, because honestly when we were investing back you know five years ago Mina had enough opportunities, limited capital, so we were already too busy with what we had on the table. Uh, and uh, Pakistani venture or entrepreneurial ecosystem was not uh, was not flourishing as it is now. Since then, you know, I've done probably a couple of trips a year for the past three to four years. Uh, better acquaint myself with the market, the players, the ecosystem, what works, what doesn't. People like yourself and the various great things that you're doing, and so on and so forth. Just to summarize, so yeah, VC has been uh, uh, what I've been doing for the past, let's say, 15 years. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Does that that's help? Great. Or is that yes, big yes, enough for you? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so to start with, uh, we we most of us know that IFC is part of the World Bank Group, but yeah. to to understand it better. uh what are the key areas is it is it more on the development side it's more on the startup yeah. side and if it's on the startup side side what what's the ticket side okay and 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 what are the main areas or the verticals that that are favorable or where ifc looks into so this is this is basically just the basics of it so that uh many of our audience or the viewers on facebook uh they 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 should get get to know more about the mandate and how it works okay no that's a good question because honestly not a lot of people know this especially when markets are still nascent like when i joined ifc around 4 years ago not many in people in mina knew what it is and now we have a quite significant presence here so you take a step back i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what the world bank does 
So think of it, to simplify it the easiest way possible is the World Bank focuses on supporting governments and working with governments, policies, and setting those up, while the IFC is the private sector arm of the group. The IFC as a whole focuses on investing in the private sector as any other commercial investor. That being said, traditionally, IFC focuses on a number of sectors, uh, financial institutions and insurance, and FIG is what we call it, manufacturing, agricultural services, uh, and the like. So that's what typically IFC does, predominantly investing in both equity and debt. Uh, I am part of the venture capital unit. So we focus on the asset class, uh, the VC asset class. My specific role is I oversee the Middle East, North Africa, Pakistan, and more recently, uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And when we talk about VC, what VC for us, it's, it's really divided into two buckets. The first bucket is... Uh, uh, what we call indirect investments. So this is fund of fund investments. And what we do there is we try, so if you take a step back, what we try to do in the VC department is address the value chain of the entrepreneurial journey from A to Z. So from idea up to growth. And how we do that, we do that through the two buckets I mentioned, direct and indirect. Let's start with the indirect because that addresses the value chain at the beginning. So we come into what we call uh, indirect is as an LP or limited partner and we invest in funds. And that is everything from early stage programs and accelerators up to your typical series A and B growth stage ones. And that we've done a lot in the Middle East uh, as well as Pakistan. So the first VC investment we made in Pakistan is with a fund called Sarmayakar. And it took us a long time to find uh, someone to partner with. And it was you know, one of the first few funds that opened up in Pakistan. We were very comfortable with that. In MENA, just to give you an indication, we are with the likes of Beko, Wamda, Algebra, Flat6 Labs, Iptikar, uh, and so on. So what we try to do there is we try to address the journey, the entrepreneurship as it begins from an idea stage to the accelerators, then early stage funds, and your growth stage funds. From a direct investment perspective, that's uh, we do that as well. So typical to similar what do VC funds do, we do ourselves uh, through co-investing with our funds or directly into opportunities that we uh, you know we, we we find attractive, let's say, and that's usually focused on the growth stage. So what that means for us is we like to label it as Series B, ideally checks of five plus million dollars as part of a round, so really later stage. Um, uh, uh, we do have, some, we have in the past gone below that threshold, but it's on a case by case basis. So that's generally from a high level perspective. On the direct front, uh, in MENA, we were in the likes of Fauri, uh, Network International, Souk, and Vizipta. Those all four of them we've exited already. Uh, two through IPOs, other two through trade sales. Uh, one to Amazon, as everyone knows. And uh, we currently hold a company called Trucker out of the UAE. Sorry, that has operations in the UAE, Saudi, Egypt, and Jordan, as well as Yellow Door. In Pakistan, unfortunately, we have not done a direct deal yet. We have looked at a handful. Uh, but we have not. I don't think the market is there yet in terms of the magnet number of deals that we can look at. There are a few great opportunities, but we've never pulled the trigger on any of them. In terms of sectorial focus, uh, I like to say we're opportunistic tech, but realistically, we do have certain verticals uh, that uh, we like. Uh, in specific, I would say, if you take a look at what we've done in the past, we've done in the past a lot of consumer internet uh, uh, and e-commerce. Right now, we're focusing a lot on logistic and logistic tech. So that is across the value chain. Uh, we like uh, ed tech, health tech, uh, agri tech, uh, uh, B2B enterprise SaaS or marketplaces along those lines. Uh, so that's what we like right now. And we're seeing a lot of it. But generally, we try to be as opportunistic as we can see. In terms of what we look at when we're investing directly, because I think that is something you asked about very quickly as well. So I think far and foremost, you know, the mission that we were trying to do is make the world a better place, right? So, you know, support good businesses to be able to uh, provide developmental impact as well as additionality to everything that we do. So the first question we ask ourselves, because we're a private sector commercial investor, is this investment going to make us money? So if that is the case and we believe in that, then we take another, we put the developmental hat alongside that. And we start thinking about, you know, what developmental impact is this business doing? 
you know, uh, for example, when you look at a fintech business, what is the developmental impact of a fintech business? A financial inclusion, providing people the ability to, you know, to make money, spend money, uh, and so on and so forth. E-commerce, we can get into that. That's the first part of it. The second part of it, what value do we bring to the table? So yes, we are commercial investors. Yes, we want to have developmental impact, but we also want to bring something to the table. Is it a strategic value? Is it the brand that helps kind of, uh, you know, deploy other capital alongside us? Uh, uh, what is the real additionality that we bring? So that's very, you know, a high level perspective what we do. Um, similar to, uh, similar uh, to what I do for this region, we do have offices of people, uh, colleagues like myself doing this for Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia as a whole, different, different locations, uh, and our HQ is based out of DC. So really we are very focused on emerging markets and solving them. And what works and works very well, and we've noticed it, especially now that we're coming, you know, I've been spending a lot more time in Pakistan, you know, problems in emerging markets are very, very similar. So a company solving a problem in a market like Egypt, let's say mass transit and transportation, you know, can really easily replicate that model in other markets that have similar problems, such as Pakistan, such as Nigeria, such as Kenya, and so on and so forth. So what we try I think to that do we saw we that have, with Swivel in Pakistan. Swivel is yeah, a so, perfect example. So yes. Swivel was a, a company that it was one of our funds Beko invested in. So Swivel came to Egypt, it was born out of Egypt. Uh, you know, what we call the Kareem cartel, right? Uh, the people who have left Kareem and made a bit of money and now are launching up businesses. We have like six or seven of them that are doing very well. Uh, Swivel was an example of an entrepreneur who left Kareem. Uh, so a really big problem in mass transit and public transportation in Egypt and solved that. And albeit, he realized that this is the same exact problem uh, in other key markets, such as Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Pakistan, and a few others, and started expanding into those markets to solve those problems, and the numbers speak for themselves. And obviously, there are people doing the same thing, but I would say they were one of the pioneers, let's say, who, who did that uh, uh, out of Egypt. And this is just one example. We're seeing that now in the trucking space, right? I haven't seen it in Pakistan yet, but you know the B2B trucking space, so the Uber for trucks. We invested in a company called uh, uh, Trucker recently that does both long haul and uh, long haul trucking loads through a marketplace, both domestically and cross border. Uh, we've also, just to give you an example, that's one we did. We have the same exact investment. Uh, in Nigeria called Kobo 360, in India called uh, Black Buck, and in China called Full Trucker Alliance. So that is one of the key value adds that we bring to the table. And when we look at any investments that we think of, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, how does, you know, have we seen this model before? Is this unique model? Can it be translated into other emerging markets? And so, on and so, so I don't know if that answers your question, but th that's a very high level so, uh, so, so. Uh, oversight. So, so just to just to add what you have just shared, uh, I think so. If we look at ed techs and if we look at health techs in Pakistan, uh, it's easier to somehow equate them with with the development impact which you just shared. Yeah, and it 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 has they have this strategic value as well. But many yeah. of the startups in Pakistan, uh, let's say a robotic company. Uh, which which eventually becomes a STEM robotic company, which teaches yeah. uh, school children and all. Uh, how to how to find this development impact in a in in that sort of a startup, which might start from from let's say few cities of Pakistan. Uh, yeah. Do you guys look at the long term, like 10, 12, 15, 20 years impact, uh, or or is it more of a choice of uh, finding the strategic value first and then impact or it, it, it's side by side? So I think it's a scale, right? So you need to measure the scale. So what developmental impact versus what returns and commercial viability those businesses have? And I think you try to measure that scale. Uh, each case is unique, right? So we do have a framework for developmental impact measurement at IFC called DOTS. It's one of the first globally by DFIs that have been established. And anyone who's interested in that can either reach out to me or just search for it. There's a whole section on our portal or our website that discusses that. 
And what we do is, yeah, we are patient money, right? We don't, we're not coming in to do a quick flip. We are coming in for the long-term gain of both financially as well as developmentally. So that's how we do. We try to measure it across the portfolio. But, you know, you asked a robotics a specific example. So we try to look at that business, the underlying technology and the IP. Uh, who is it serving? How is it serving it? What markets are getting it? Who is the end stakeholder? Can this IP be used into, or this technology be used into other venues? It, 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 really, it's, it's a case by case. And unless you have a bit more details about the opportunity or the business that we're looking at, uh, I can't answer that. But like, I'll give you an example. So I have a lot of people who've asked us, you know, when we did a company like Souk, this is an e-commerce business. What is the additionality? What is the developmental, sorry, what is the developmental impact of an e-commerce business? So the answer to that is, A, you're providing people's means to sell products that they didn't have that. You're marketing businesses online. You're providing them with the tools to disseminate their businesses as well as make money off them. Uh, uh, and giving them more of a regional or global lens for the products or the business's global lens. That's, for example, what developmental work comes out of it. Developmental does not really need, it could be everything from like saving lives and giving people basic nutrition up to, you know, giving them the ability to have financial inclusion and disseminate goods and so on and so forth. So it really, it really depends. There's a spectrum that you try to measure against. And overall, you want your overall portfolio to have a very strong positive developmental impact. Some may have higher, some may have less. Obviously, healthcare is easy. Education is easy. Robotics could be more complicated. You know, if it's a robotic that's helping save lives somehow, uh, uh, automate processes, supply chains, et cetera, it could be an interesting one there from a developmental perspective. Interesting. So, uh, so now, now we are coming to our uh, uh, current topic as well. Uh, how, how, did did anyone envisioned, or it was more of a uh, Bill Gates talk that that he that he predicted a virus might hit all of us for in the next five years, or was there any discussion in in any of your strategic meetings, or was is is the world prepared? Is IFC prepared for something like that, or uh, a COVID nineteen has just hit us? Yeah. See, listen, this is a good question, and it's way above my pay grade, right? I don't have the answer. To that. Was I? Could did I see it coming? Honestly, no. I don't think anyone saw it coming. I think people, you know, the Gates prediction, whatnot. You know, people can take that as they see fit. But generally, like viruses have happened in the past. As market and, and financial markets crash and go up and they have these cycles, it seems like this is another cycle to take place. Did we see it coming? As Isa, personally, I, 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 I would say probably around January's time when we started hearing about it in, uh, in, uh, in, in China, I started breaking precaution. I stopped go. I, you know, I started working from home right before others did. So it's really, you know, what and how you educate yourself about this matter. So I think, especially when it comes to VCs and COVID and everyone talking about that topic, you know, this is unprecedented times, you know. We have not gone through this before, right? Not in my lifetime, not in yours, probably not in our parents' lifetimes as well. The, maybe some iterations of it, such as SARS and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, not to the magnitude that, that it's put the world Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, yeah. I can hear you. Sorry, I think I got disconnected for a second. Where did I leave? Where was I? Yes, it was. We we heard the the uh, you were discussing about the impact of COVID in our lifetime yeah. and in our parents' lifetime. Yeah, yeah. So like, I don't think anyone could have seen it coming. We can all predict and give advice, and I can tell you what we've seen, what worked, what doesn't. But generally, we don't know how this is gonna pan out. Uh, do we feel that there will be a solution soon? I hope so. I think eventually things will go back to normal. But how do we navigate this, these uncharted waters right now is, is the key question. And there's been a lot of content, a lot of discussions uh, about this. Like, for example, yesterday I read an article uh, that was talking about like 
how to manage, you know, COVID cost cutting and so on and so forth. I'm like, these are all generally important things and crisis management tools that we are all talking about. But, you know, what the virus is doing and how it's affecting our day-to-day, our consumer behavior, the way we go about things, I think is changing. And I think some markets are seeing it harder than others. Like, I'll tell you, I haven't left my house in seven weeks now. Not even for a breath of fresh air. And we're not allowed to. We're in complete lockdown here in Dubai. So it's it's because that's where I'm based off of right now. It's 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 you know uncharted water. You know tough times ahead, but I think we will come out of it soon enough. Uh, did we see it coming? I didn't. Maybe others did, but uh, I would say, you know, I think uh, eventually we'll start seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. So so just a related uh, question to it. Uh, mm-hmm. So. Are we what what should startups or new businesses plan? Uh, should they go into a more of a bootstrapping mode, or should they pivot their their business models according to the conditions we have? So someone like uh, there there might be many startups that are already working from home, but some might have traditional business models that are brick and mortar and more focused towards. Uh, uh, building something yeah. or manufacturing something. So, what should be a what should be their pivot? And on the investment side, uh, what what should they expect now? It should they should uh, what 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 is the runway for them? Okay, cool. No, so I think before I answer those uh, uh, good questions, I'm gonna take a step back and give you some insights that I got recently from a colleague of mine who oversees our China portfolio. Uh, Because technically, that is a way for you to see a month or two ahead. So, you know, because they are two months, let's say, ahead of most other countries right now when it comes to what's happened. So if you take a look at key sectors and what's happened there. So logistic and logistic in general is back to 90% to where it was in 2019 last year. Restaurants are back to probably half of where they were a year ago. Online groceries is another sector that's they continue to boom and grow. Tourism, travel, uh, uh, they're still at, at, at you know standstill, and we don't see them coming back for another year or so. Uh, e-commerce is picking up and continue to grow drastically. Construction, manufacturing, so a big hit over the past quarter. I don't think that will come back. So long story short, you know, there will be a recovery and people will come back. Uh, you know, businesses will eventually start to come back. I think three buckets here that you asked about. Pivot, what should they do, cost saving, and investments. Let's start with uh, uh, cost saving. So I think one of the most important things that I've seen, and again, you can take it with a grain of salt, is uh, cash is king right now. So as a startup, as an entrepreneur, my advice personally, uh, again, right or wrong, is you need to make sure you have enough cash in the bank to sustain your operations you know some people tell you three some people six some people 12 months i would say at least six to 12 months we don't know how long this will take how long will the market recover even if it does recover or we find the solution over the coming coming couple of months how long uh, will the lag be for you to start making revenue? just make sure you have enough runway to be able to sustain your business how do you do that basically take a step back and really look at your business operations, uh, uh, your business as a whole. You know, try to cut the fat and stick to it. I think this is a good exercise to do anyways, and will help you down the line. So cut, cut the unnecessary cost. Try to renegotiate a, 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 a key contract terms, payments that you have within reason. Uh, look at your staff base. And there's many different ways you can go about that. You know, uh, I've seen startups that have gone from mass firings to startups that have taken cuts across the value chain, to some startups have taken across the value chain, but different percentages across the seniority. So senior people for gone salary, less uh, senior people, more uh, junior staff, less of a hit. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, people put staff on term temporary unpaid leave. So it really depends on you and your business, but definitely think of it as a survival mode. Uh, make sure that you have enough of a cash cushion to get your business uh, through this time. And again, manage your business and manage your cash flow for a weekly basis. So that's one point to think about. I think uh, 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 on on the cost-saving question that you have. But more importantly, 
you know, take a step. Yeah, I think that's uh, that on that specific point. I'm going to jump to the other one, the pivot question. So I think before you think about pivoting, I think this is a great time to go back and reflect on your business. Fundamentals, understand the fundamentals of your business. What drives it? Is this the relevant business model for you? Is this model going to survive down the line or is this something I need to adapt right now to the current climate and current crisis? Uh, uh, the fundamentals of business previously, you know, for example, what drives my unit economics? How do I look at that profitability? Those are things you need to look at that. And based on that, you can decide to pivot. And I have an amazing example that I, I used the other day when I was having a chat with uh, a, a, a few colleagues. Is a good friend of mine on a startup here in the Middle East that focuses on, uh, uh, it's a marketplace for house help. So people who can either be, uh, come and clean the apartments, uh, people who can come and uh, uh, maintenance and so on and so forth. They didn't own uh, the personnel, similar to Uber. It's a gig economy type of model uh, where they basically were a marketplace to provide that. But what they did, they managed the logistic value chain is they partnered with providers, especially in markets like Saudi, the UAE, and so forth, to provide the, to, the, the means to transport these, uh, these, 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 these workers uh, uh, to provide that service. As the markets shut down, distancing and whatnot, they were told to stop operations completely. So the business went from growing 30% month on month, and one of the leaders in this space, to zero. So what did the CEO do? He took a step back, did some cost cutting across the value chain, optimized his burn, uh, made sure he had cash runway as is with the team to continue. But what then he realized there's a big opportunities in food and food delivery, especially in the grocery space. He didn't want to get into that space, but he does have a fleet uh, uh, that can help uh, that can help. Uh, 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 these existing businesses that are struggling with the demand to meet their demand uh, by offering them unique APA technology that will able to optimize the value chain and the process and the deliveries and B, more importantly, uh, uh, open up uh, uh, additional means of transportation or additional, let's say, routes for them uh, to meet their demand. So they pivoted into that. That's what he's doing thing right now and it's working out for him. So it really depends on your business from a business perspective. But the most important thing, make sure you have a resilient, strong business. A good idea will go, you know, will survive. Make sure you have and keep and retain your talent and have a strong team. And you'll find a way to figure it out as you go. So that's on the pivot question or the point that you asked about. And I think the last one uh, that you asked about was investments and what you should, should expect. Oof, that is a very, very tough question, right? I think, I think what I would answer here, or just to think about it, remind me, it really depends on the market. So Pakistan is still nascent when it comes to venture and venture investing. There's a lot that has happened from an entrepreneurial ecosystem. A lot of entrepreneurs are emerging, great ideas, good people. The funding is still lagging, but it's improving drastically. I think what you'll see is a lot of existing funds that have capital will probably take a step back and slow down new investments and start focusing on portfolio and portfolio support and portfolio management and make sure these portfolio companies survive and continue to thrive uh, because obviously the returns and, and, and uh, to their LPs and stakeholders is driven by the fact that they need to you know, make money at the end of the day. So I would say you'd see a lot of that. I think new funds with a bit of dry power will still invest, but generally I think you will have a, a bit of a crunch when it comes to cash at the seed to series A level. I think at the later part of the value chain, you will still see some activity. I think there will be uh, some pressure when it comes to series C and above when it comes to valuation, uh, but you will, they will be raising significant funds, I think, towards the end of the year. How long this will sustain, I don't know. Only time will tell, but I would say, you know, I don't see the funding landscape going back to where it is till end of the year, personally. Um, above and beyond that, you know, put yourself in the investor's shoes. You know, what are they looking for? What are they thinking of? If you can make a case, I'm sure you can find the right investor, but I think it's going to be tough for the time being. Uh, but what we will see, if you ask me, is investors changing the way they approach things. 
how they, they invest. I think they will be driven a lot more by fundamentals and value investing going forward. So people will only look at deals that they can significantly add value, companies that have strong fundamentals, uh, uh, looking at profitability, financials will be different. You know, people look at that with different lens than they used to in the past. I hope those answer the questions that you had. So, so we have uh, one question from Walid. Walid, if you want to ask it, uh, uh, you can ask on uh, microphone or I can just read your question. Walid, can you ask it, uh, ask it directly or uh, yeah, should sure. I, shall I just read? Okay, please, please ask. Hello, please sir, how are you doing? I'm great. Uh, how are you? Uh, great. Yeah, so uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, currently in the VC space, uh, are they comfortable investing in startups and businesses who uh, would just like to pivot uh, given the current uh, uh, COVID conditions? Uh, let's say they are operating in a transportation or energy sector. Because everybody is saying and every VC and every investor is saying to save cash, yes, we want liquidity. And that's a given. We have optimized our uh, cash flows. Uh, we have optimized our payment terms. But when it comes to pivoting, every startup and every business requires an additional uh, investment, right? And for I, that investment, yeah. you have to do a trade-off between whether the, uh, whether you are investing in the right uh, direction or not. So I just wanted to get a sense of the VC space. Are they comfortable investing in it, or are they just want to wait it out and see? if there is a second uh, COVID-19 wave or something like that? So I don't think there's a specific answer to that. Are they going to wait it out? Only time will tell. But I'll tell you how I would look at it if I was back in my private sector capacity wearing a, you know, a venture, a, you know, a commercial venture investor's hat. I'm not saying that we're not. But I'm talking, you know, a, a typical VC fund uh, investor. I think... Uh, I think pivoting shouldn't be taken as a negative. It really depends on what your business and what you're doing. So far and foremost, you know, especially at the, you know, you seem to be talking about the earlier part of the value chain. So these companies, if I'm not mistaken, correct me, are seed or you know early stage businesses. I think pivot generally, COVID or not, is really part of the nature. You're investing in people, right? Fundamentally, we're looking to invest in strong entrepreneurs and strong people who can who are resilient and will make businesses work regardless of what happens. So I think if you as a business see your business going nowhere uh, uh, and it's dead in the water and you pivot uh, into a set, in, a, in a space that you can actually defend, then I think that's a case that you can make and a case that can be defended. And an investor, uh, if you sell that to the investor, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have a problem there. But it really, it really depends on the business, the stage, the space, and how we go about things. And why? I don't think pivot should be taken lightly. It, like, it would be scaring people away. But again, some people will tell you, like, you know, great, you've pivoted. Show me that this is going to work. Maybe they'll see, they'll want to see a bit more proof, a bit more fundamentals. But I think if you have a solid business on your hand, solid fundamentals, a solid trajectory, and a good case that you can make for who you are as a team and as a business model, I think you'll find the money. I don't think it should be an issue. Unfortunately, again, as I mentioned, and I alluded to that in Pakistan, the funding landscape is, is improving drastically, but it's not as, uh, as strong as, uh, as it should be yet. I think it will change in due time as regional, uh, as local investors come into the play, a, a lot of international money coming and pouring into Pakistan. Uh, maybe it'll slow down now, but I think uh, uh, with what you have, if you have a good business and you've pivoted, you should be having the problem. I don't know if that answers your question, but I can take another stab at it if it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Great. Okay, so we we have some other friends as well. Mohsin, Imran, Essen, Fessin, Mariam, Muin Bartasab, Khizar, Mumina, Shine. Uh, anyone else has a question? I have a question. Yes, uh, yes, Imran. Uh, that is not related to COVID-19 uh, specifically. It's related to uh, Pakistan as uh, as a as a whole. 
and the yes. inv investors' uh, perception and the landscape itself. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that IFC is, uh, you know, interested in uh, doing this, uh, becoming LPs in other funds, or do let's say Series B or let's say a bigger Series A, uh, you know, rounds. And you mentioned a few companies. Uh, I just think that you know, uh, when you look at Pakistan right now, uh, probably the ticket size could not be as mm -hmm. big as as what you you have done in. Let's of say, course in uae or you know similar investments in quarry in egypt or swivel etc so probably from that angle uh, yourself as well as other vcs and mature investors who are coming from outside of pakistan uh, probably they should look at small ticket sizes as well because there are a lot of good you know startups uh, but uh, the ticket size would not be as big as what you are used to of doing in the middle east Yeah, no, I think it's a relevant point. But again, I think how we address that, because it's definitely a point to be made there, especially when markets are still nascent uh, and still at the earlier part of the value chain. For us, how we address that uh, is really a, a, a function of uh, capital and resources that we have. For you to do seed, if you take a, if you take a stick back at the VC model fundamentally, for you to make early stage investments work, you have to have a lot more bets across the value chain. So rather than me doing, let's say as a fund, 10 bets at series A plus or B, you need to be doing 20 to 30 bets at seed to be able to you know, mitigate the risk that you're getting into and potentially the returns. I'm a big believer personally in seed. That's what I did most of my career, three A investments, let's say. Uh, 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 but generally at IFC, we approach from a risk profile, we'd rather put our direct investments at the B and above level, five plus million dollar checks as part of a round. We understand that is not the case in certain markets. We have done lower checks in the past, but really on a case by case basis. And if we really feel those entrepreneurs and, and the businesses that we're looking at are, you know, superstars and really differentiate themselves and are, uh, are bets that we should be doing, especially if it's a sector we understand and can see that pattern recognition. But that doesn't mean we don't look at this space. So we do look at it, but how we try to address it, as I mentioned earlier, is through fund of funds. So rather than us coming in and being on the ground, eyes and ears in every market and investing at C and A, we invest in funds. And the first bet we took in Pakistan so far is Sarmaya Kal uh, with Rabil and the fund there. You know, we will potentially be doing more down the line uh, across the different stages. So we'd like to address funds that address the different stages and create that continuity. And a great example that we did over, took three years to showcase this example, is out of Egypt. So we invested in an accelerator called Flat Six Labs. That graduated a company. That company has gone to get follow-on investments from our uh, 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 Series A-focused fund and eventually our Series B-focused fund. And now we're looking at it as a direct investment. So that's how we create these, that continuity and eventually hope to invest in them if we'd miss them at the seed and series A level. Uh, but this is us and this is our risk profile and appetite. So a lot of investors now from the MENA region also looking at Pakistan as a market. So I think MEVP uh, did a bet recently in Baikia. Uh, so that's an example of people opening their up their eye. I know Wamda has done many multiple trips to Pakistan and is looking at that market. There's a few funds that are opening up as we speak because there's a lot of cash in the community right now going to VC in MENA. Hopefully it will continue. Uh, but MENA as a market is, is quite large and convoluted. You know, technically it's a safer bet for me to make an investment in Pakistan. Why? Because you have a population of, uh, a large population of like around 200 million, if I'm not mistaken, people that is homogenous in one market and one country under the same rules and regulation to a certain extent. In MENA, when I do a deal, I'm talking about 350 million people across, what, 22 countries or something like that. So it's a lot more difficult, actually, to do business there. But, uh, and I think people are realizing that and Pakistan will become a market where we have a lot more interest globally into that space. And you're already hearing of, like, a lot of international investors are already putting money and looking at deals as we speak there at the stage that you're talking about. 
Could I ask? Could I ask a question? Yes, my, my term, you, you may ask. You may ask. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, I, I actually, I, I couldn't for some reason couldn't uh, post the, the question on chat. That's why I'm just asking. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, Isa, yeah, yeah. thanks for thanks for giving your uh, you know uh, views and uh, insights. This is really helpful. Uh, my question is basically uh, to do with the, the venture capital sector, you know, the industry. Um, mm -hmm. There's been some progress, but still, uh, we still are slow in taking off. So what can you do and what can IFC do to somehow tap the, those sources of capital that exist, but somehow aren't coming into the venture capital space? You know, how can you uh, unlock yeah. those reserves of capital? Thanks. So, question, just to clarify, what reserves are you talking about? <laughs> I'd like to know. But no, joking aside, I think we lost I'm, I'm Steve because your face. I think we lost him. Anyhow, so what, what can we do? I think... I'll answer that by not talking about what IFC I do. I can think we'll answer that by saying what everyone can do, right? If you build good businesses, mm -hmm. you're going to struggle at first to find that first few angel and seed checks. But I think they're abundant right now. And there's a lot of interest and capital locally in Pakistan that will help serve you there. You know, uh, 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 Samayakar is one fund, but I know of four or five other funds that have opened up over the past 18 months that are looking at that stage in that space. So I think far and foremost, build good businesses. Once you get to that level where you want to start scaling and growing, it's not going to be that difficult. It will be more difficult than other more emerging markets and more established markets. I'll give you that. But the pace of growth that we're seeing and the interest is strong. People want to make money. End of the day, right? Investors want to make right. money. If you showcase that good idea, people will come. And I know this is a very generic answer, but it's a true, true, true answer. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes a difference. Uh, so there are always risks that others will keep looking at, like political risk, instability, currency, uh, 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 restrictions on getting your money in and out, etc. that will always come into play. That's why I think what people can do is all of these funds and players that are at the early stage, they need to expose themselves a lot more globally and regionally to their peers, the neighbors across the value chain. Uh, uh, to build that trust and interest because investors will come if they have a partner, local partner that they would trust and come alongside. MEVP did, I'm using Baiki as an example because, uh, uh, you know, I know that through my experience or exposure to uh, Samaikar, came in because they trusted Samaikar as a local partner as well as the other investors on the table to help take them down the, uh, across the board and mitigate that risk for them. So I think those pools of capital are interested, but they are scared. So how do you mitigate that risk is A, have good partners alongside them locally. Be fair as investors when you're coming into the early part of the value chain. You know, my first trip to Pakistan, I think I left uh, uh, with a lot of people not liking me because mm -hmm. I gave it to them straight. There was investors that we met, uh, and this was around four years ago, that mm -hmm. were giving entrepreneurs you know, pennies and taking 30, 40% of 50% of their business. And I'm like, this is unacceptable. This is, how are we going to incentivize the entrepreneur fundamentally to give you a good business? You don't own this business. You're helping them get to that level and you're getting rewarded as an equity holder of that business. So as an entrepreneur by Series B, he owns less than 5% of the business. What's the incentive for him to make this a, a few hundred million dollar or billion dollar business? And I think a good example of someone who's done it very well, and I respect them a lot, is uh, 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 the team from Zameen. You know, if they, you take a look at how they've managed to struggle against the odd when there was no ecosystem in Pakistan and grow that business to where it is right now, I think that's a testament of, you know, an example of how someone can do it. And you're seeing a lot more of that. You have the local players, uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm on like four hours of sleep. Uh, the one that does similar to Swivel, uh, um, Airlift. Airlift. Uh, Airlift doing what they're doing. Uh, you have people like, uh, we mentioned, uh, we mentioned uh, Dawai. I was talking to the entrepreneur mm -hmm. the other day, doing some nice innovative things. There's so many. You have the, the portfolio from eye to eye. 
Fatima Venture and Gobi. There's so many players out there and good portfolios and companies. Partner with them and leverage them to get you that exposure. Okay. Great. Easier said than done, obviously. And, uh, you know, the great thing about my job, I can say all of this stuff. It could mean nothing in reality, but, you know, <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope it does mean something. Great. So, so Mo- Mohsen, can you ask this uh, on microphone or just... Okay. Mohsen, are you there? So, I think so, Mohsen. Mohsen has a question. Uh, but then increase... Yes, yes, Mohsen, please go ahead and ask. Uh, hi, sir. This is Mohsen. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to check. Uh, so, you know, from the face of it, it looks that the companies or the seed stage companies which are building right now, they're in a better position because uh, they would have access to better talent, which is available as a surplus. And they have uh, time for because others are pivoting at this moment. But from uh, the question was that over the next six to 12 months where we see increased digitization, be it the mm-hmm. grocery purchases or others. So there would be an increased digitization in, in multiple spaces from health tech to retail tech to Ed tech. So who do you think would be the biggest beneficiaries out of these this digitization exercises in your portfolio? When I want to, want to see in your portfolio, so we will also get to know that how are you looking at the different sectors which are already existing, benefiting out of this digitization wave that will happen over the next six to nine months? Yeah, so I think it really depends from our portfolio because we have a global one. We're seeing a lot of, you know, anyone in the e-commerce, groceries uh, slash you know, e-commerce enables and logistic are doing very well. There are companies that are getting hit drastically, but you know, in our portfolio, because of the way we look at things, generally, most of them are doing okay. But I'm going to answer your question in a different way, right? I think you take a step back and take a look at consumer behavior and how what happens is happening right now. And I don't think Pakistan is as severe as a case as other markets that you're seeing. Uh, it may, I hope not, happen soon, uh, uh, where, where, where the rule of law will come a lot stronger and people realize what it is to be social distancing. I think generally consumer behavior is changing. And this is across the board. I think the way we see retail and shopping, the way we even look at sports, uh, social interaction, gym and exercise, uh, education, entertainment, media, digital payments, you know, all of these are changing. So if you as an entrepreneur are finding ways to leverage what that change is and the consumer behavior and how it's changing, uh, you know, uh, that's a very good opportunity. Uh, that's something to look at. I think that's how I would approach it. But again, from our portfolio, just to go back to the specific question that you had, uh, logistic players that are providing good transportation and so on are doing well. People moving businesses less so. Uh, e-commerce are doing very well uh, across the value chain. Uh, we're seeing a lot of our businesses, we've done a few in Africa that are focused on marketplaces that connect raw materials, supply providers with end buyers, uh, let's say, uh, are doing very well. So or people who are trying to digitize the value chain, especially connecting uh, you know, non-digital businesses together. I think those type of businesses from our portfolio will be doing very well and growing. And actually, some are on the closing rounds as we speak. Thank you, Isa. That's great. Uh, anyone else has has a question? We have like seven, eight minutes uh, to go. If someone else has has a question, they may ask. Um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Could I ask about um, yes, yes, my, my yes, again. health? Yes. Um, you know, um, basically, this is this is uh, this is the big challenge, right? This is the big crisis, and um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, um, uh, some of it obviously is happening by itself. But um, you know, going back to IFC, um, you know, you have you, you have investments all over the world, regionally. So, um, have you thought of? Uh, 
you know, uh, a, a special role that you could play to to actually that would end up helping out in the crisis through the tools that you have, you know, through the venture capital tools that you have. Just wondering if that's that's something that you're looking at. It is something we're looking at. And I think there was a few announcements globally. I think we got a stimulus package that is quite large recently uh, uh, to for us to be able to do that exactly. But I think phase A of that approach will probably most likely focus on our existing client base and portfolios globally. Uh, so that's how we go about it, trying to make sure uh, uh, the people that we've supported and our partners with continue to thrive. Uh, I think phase B will potentially start being expanded across the value chain to uh, include others that are outside uh, that arena. Uh, honestly, uh, uh, phase two, I think I'm a bit more excited about too, because that will potentially extend into uh, uh, how can we not just only support our clients, people outside, how can we support our funds who in turn support their portfolio companies and so on and so forth. So we are looking at it, but we are still open for business. Right? We have not stopped investing. Yes, we're focusing on portfolio and invest, uh, uh, making sure our portfolio is doing well. But we're still executing on the pipeline that we invested in in the past uh, or pipeline that we were looking at in the past. We're still looking at new opportunities. Uh, uh, we may be slightly uh, 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 more stringent, not the right word, but slightly more diligent uh, to better understand the COVID effect and how that affects the company and the portfolio and the businesses that we're looking at. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, we've, I've taken a, a recent deal to my IC, and that's exactly the conversation that we had. So typical, like any deal that we looked at in the past, we looked at the opportunity of fundamentals, everything that we need to look at uh, through our process. But then we had a small discussion, a side discussion about what we like to call the COVID effect, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how that affects a business like this and what that means down the line. And you still take a bet. And actually... You know, as I mentioned before, cash is king. That goes to the investors as well, non IFC. You know, any investor with money right now, anyone launching a fund right now, this is one of the best years to do that. Why? Because you're going to have a lot of great opportunities, not a lot of competition. So you have the pick of the crop, right? Mm. At, at hopefully good terms and valuations. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Just so, yes, 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 yeah. my son. You wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, just just another just another question uh, concerning you know impact investing. So since you look at the developmental uh, angle, so it sounds like uh, you know that's sort of like impact investing. So do you work together with other impact investors like you know like the Acumen Fund? And uh, where do you where do you place yourself in that space? I mean, are you partially an impact investor or? or would you categorize yourself as an impact investor? How do you categorize so, yourself? I don't know. You, you should. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I would <laughs> personally categorize what we do as, uh, and this is. This, that's, I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization. Obviously, is we impact is definitely core form core to what we do. A developmental impact, in specific, is what we focus on and what we like to do and and and, and achieve. Uh, but we are fundamentally commercial investors as well. So mm -hmm. we need to make money off the deals that we do and look at while delivering good to the world. So yes, we do partner with a lot of other DFIs uh, and other players across the value chain. Okay, thanks. Great. So anyone else or we will just sum it up for today. So... Uh, Thank you, Isa. Uh, any any parting note or advice to to startups? We we did discuss about the pivot and how how they can save. Uh, they, they they should have their cost savings uh, and the the investment build up. So any 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 parting note? How to manage their their businesses in the next like six months, a year, or like five years? No, I think nothing specific than what we talked about. But I would say, like, you know, it's tough times. It's not easy to be an entrepreneur right now. Well, it may be if you're in the right sector. But generally, most people are finding it challenging. You know, don't lose hope. Things hopefully will clear up. You know, eventually people forget and move on in life. Uh, hopefully that will happen sooner than later. But in the meantime, focus on your business. Use this time to 
either it be pivot, fix what you have, uh, uh, build on what you have, be ready for the next phase, uh, and make sure you have some runway or enough runway to be able to sustain that while you do that. Uh, and be safe, I think, is the most important thing. Social distance. <laughs> no need to gather people. I'm looking out of the window right now, and I still see people walking <laughs> around with the cops stopping them. But, you know, it's don't do that. Okay, great. So, so we might, we might fi- find some entrepreneurs working on this social distancing, maybe making it more... Uh, uh, easier to to communicate or maybe just a uh, just application to limit the social distancing effect uh, i don't know but it's it's scary so great great thank you thank you isa for your time and uh, we had a great discussion we had a great interaction and uh, thank you and uh, we'll we'll have some more in, in two days time